ever feel like high school history class kind of like skimmed the surface of things? Totally. Like we got the spark notes, but not the whole story. Right. So today we're diving deep into one of those figures who deserves way more than a textbook blurb. Ooh, I like where this is going. Get ready for Sophocles beyond the, oh yeah, that Greek tragedy guy, right? That's totally. We're talking about the man himself, his yeah. world, his work, all based on this gold mine of an encyclopedia article I found. Nice. And trust me, this isn't just some dry history lesson. I'm already intrigued. Because Sophocles, he dealt with some seriously heavy stuff. Oh yeah? Justice, fate, family secrets, you know, the good stuff, the kind of stuff that's still messing with us centuries later. Timeless, you might say. Totally. So let's rewind to ancient Athens around 496 BCE. Okay. That's when Sophocles makes his grand entrance. And get this, he wasn't your typical starving artist struggling in a garret somewhere. Yeah. This guy came from a well-off family, got a top-notch education the whole nine yards. But wait, there's more. Even as a young guy, he was known for two things being crazy talented and unbelievably charming. Now that's a winning combination. Seriously, can you imagine being the it guy in ancient Greece, just charming everyone? Well, it speaks volumes about the values of the time. You know, back then, being well-rounded wasn't just a suggestion, it was expected. You had to be the whole package. Precisely. Excellence in everything. Arts, politics, you name it. That was the Athenian ideal. And Sophocles, he nailed it. Get this. At just 16 years old, 16, he led the victory song after the Battle of Salamis. No way. That's incredible. I know, right? Talk about a prodigy. But hold on, because this guy's resume just keeps going. He wasn't just composing victory songs. He was a big deal in Athenian politics, too. Held some seriously important government positions. That's what I'm talking about. This wasn't just a hobby. He was committed to public service. Exactly. Talk about a Renaissance man. Though, let's be real, the plays are what he's really known for. Of course. His legacy lives on. And even though we only have seven of his plays today. Seven. It's crazy to think how much has been lost to time. I know. But get this. He wrote and competed in at least 30 dramatic festivals during his lifetime. Wow. 30. Just imagine the sheer volume of work that represents. This guy was basically the Shakespeare of his day, putting out hit after hit. More than a hit maker, he was a champion. We're talking an estimated 24 victories out of those 30 festivals. Can you believe it? Seriously, that's like winning an Oscar every other year for your entire career. And he wasn't exactly up against amateurs. We're talking about legendary playwrights like Aeschylus the Competition was fierce. So what was his secret? How did he blow everyone else out of the water? Did the encyclopedia article tell us? It did, and it's actually pretty fascinating. Oh, do tell. One of the things that made Sophocles so revolutionary was his introduction of the third actor on stage. Wait, hold up. You're telling me before Sophocles it was just two actors? Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Imagine those poor actors juggling multiple roles, trying to keep the story straight. Wow, talk about a challenge. No wonder Sophocles was a game changer. Right. With that third actor, Suddenly, the possibilities exploded. Plots could get way more intricate. Relationships got messier. Everything became more dynamic, more human. It's like he injected a whole new level of drama into Greek tragedy. Exactly. And he didn't stop there. He also moved away from the traditional trilogy structure that was all the rage back then. Trilogy structure. Okay, for those of us who need a refresher. Sure. So back in the day, playwrights would often present three interconnected plays, kind of like a miniseries, each exploring different aspects of the same myth or story. Ah, so Sophocles decided to break the mold. He was like, nah, I'm going to focus on one powerful story. You got it. And that really shows his mastery of storytelling. He knew how to build suspense, create unforgettable characters, and deliver a knockout punch, all within the framework of a single play. Okay, you've sold me. This Sophocles guy sounds amazing. So we've got the man, we've got the times. But what about the plays themselves? What makes a Sophoclean tragedy unique? What's his signature style? Oh, get ready, because we're about to dive into the heart of Sophoclean tragedy. Buckle up. Sophocles doesn't mess around when it comes to tragedy. Oh, I'm ready. Lay it on me. What sets his tragedies apart? Picture this. Characters driven by this larger-than-life ambition. But here's the thing. Uh-oh, there's always a... But here's the thing. Right. They've also got these fatal flaws, these cracks in their armor. They're stubborn, they're blinded by pride, and they just won't back down. So it's not just fate or the gods messing with them. They're kind of asking for it. In a way, yeah. Sophocles was all about exploring those dark corners of human nature, showing how 
even the best of us can trip over our own feet. And that makes it so much more intense, right? Because we see ourselves in these struggles, like we get it, we've all been there, maybe not to the same tragic extremes, but still. So we're hooked on these characters, flaws and all, but how does Sophocles actually build that tension? What's his secret sauce? Structure, my friend. His plots are like ticking time bombs. Oh, I like that. Every scene, every line is carefully placed, ratcheting up the tension until, bam, tragedy strikes. And you see it coming. Yeah. But you're powerless to stop it. It's like that feeling of watching a car crash in slow motion. Exactly. You know it's going to be bad, but you can't look away. Which is the mark of any good story, am I right? 100%. And beyond the drama, the real reason these plays have stood the test of time. Yeah. It's those universal themes. Right. Like, why are we still talking about this guy thousands of years later? Because he nails the human experience. Mm -hmm. Individual versus society, the lure and danger of pride, the consequences of our actions, and, oh yeah, the messy, messy search for truth. It's kind of crazy how even after all these years, we're still wrestling with the same stuff, isn't it? It really is. And... Sophocles had this uncanny ability to capture those timeless dilemmas in such a powerful, unforgettable way. All right, you've convinced me. He's a genius. But let's get specific here. Give our listeners a taste of what we're talking about. What are some juicy examples from his plays that really highlight these big ideas? Okay, let's start with Ajax. Imagine a legendary warrior fresh off the battlefield of Troy. This guy's a hero, right? He is, but he's got a bit of a temper. See, Ajax gets passed over for Achilles' armor. And he totally loses it, like goes on a rampage, tries to kill his own comrades, kind of losing it. Hold up, seriously, over some armor? It's not just about the armor. Ajax dives deep into the pitfalls of pride, how easily our sense of honor can be twisted. Talk about a cautionary tale. But it makes you think, right? What happens when our self-worth is totally dependent on what others think? It's a recipe for disaster. What else you got? All right, how about Antigone? This one is still sparking debates today. Antigone's family is, well, it's complicated. Let me guess, dysfunctional family drama. I'm here for it. Oh, it's epic. So her brother dies, and the king forbids anyone from burying him. Talk about adding insult to injury, right? Harsh. But Antigone, she's devout, and she believes her brother's soul won't find peace unless he's properly laid to rest. So she has a choice. Follow her conscience or obey the law. Oh, man, talk about a rock in a hard place. And that's what makes this play so compelling. It's a timeless clash. Individual conscience versus the power of the state. Do we stand up for what we believe in, even if it means breaking the rules? Sophocles doesn't give any easy answers, and that's what makes it so powerful. Definitely makes you think, okay, we can't forget about Oedipus the King. This one is like the OG Greek tragedy. Right? It's a classic for a reason, mm -hmm. but it's so much more than just the riddle of the Sphinx. Oh, I know, the, that part's pretty awesome. Totally. But what makes Oedipus truly incredible is how Sophocles unravels the layers of truth, little by little. It's like you said before, that slow motion car crash. You see the pieces falling into place, you know it's going to be bad. But you're utterly helpless to stop it. And the brilliance is, even if you know the ending, you're still on the edge of your seat, waiting to see how it all unfolds. Okay, last one, but definitely not least. <laughs> we gotta talk about Electra. What's the deal with her? Electra. Oh, she's a force of nature. This is a woman fueled by grief and vengeance. Okay, tell me more. I'm intrigued. So picture this. Electra's father is murdered. Brutal, right? But it's the betrayal that really gets her. Uh-oh, someone's gotta pay. You got it. <laughs> Electra is convinced her own mother is in on it, and she will stop at nothing to avenge her father's death. Talk about intense family drama, but isn't there a danger in letting revenge consume you? Does Sophocles offer any guidance on that? That's the beauty of it. He lays out these complex moral dilemmas, but he doesn't force feed you the answers. It's up to us, the audience, to grapple with these questions. Is Electra justified? Or has her grief turned her into the very thing she's fighting against? Heavy stuff. You've given us a lot to chew on here. Sophocles really knew how to make an impact. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground here. We really have. From Sophocles' life to those powerhouse plays. It's mind-blowing, right? But as we wrap up, I gotta ask, what's the takeaway for our listeners? Why should these ancient Greek tragedies still matter to us today? Because deep down, people haven't really changed all that much. What do you mean? Think about it. Ambition, morality, the desire for justice, wrestling with those big life questions. Oh, I see what you're saying. 
Sophocles' characters, they're timeless. Their yeah. struggles are our struggles, even thousands of years later. It's like he had this crazy ability to see right through to the core of what it means to be human. Exactly. <laughs> and he wasn't afraid to get real to show us the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, his plays don't hold back, which is probably why they still pack such a punch. Yeah. We see ourselves in those characters, their mistakes, their victories, their downfalls. And through their stories, we start to understand our own a little bit better. It's like that saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Exactly. Human nature is human nature no matter the century. So true. Well, on that note, I want to leave our listeners with a little something to ponder. Oh, I like where this is going. If Sophocles were writing today, what modern day situations would he find tragic? Ooh, that's a good one. Would it be about a celebrity scandal, a political drama, or maybe something totally unexpected? Hmm. The possibilities are endless. Right. It makes you think. What stories are being told today that will still resonate thousands of years from now? And what will they say about us? That is the question. So until next time, keep asking those big questions. Keep exploring those timeless themes and we'll see you in the face of adversity. I don't expose, I got a still resolve. I never retreat. I embrace the struggle. I won't accept defeat. Step up. I keep my head high. Never show this bad. Step up. Step up. I stay focused on my goals, on my ground, I'm aware. Step up. Step up. I persevere through the pain and the strife. Step up. Step up. Cause I'm a man of strength. I live this lower life. I'm unpredictable, unshakable. Yeah, through the storms I'm unbreakable, unshakable I keep my mind steady, my heart cold as steel I'm unbreakable, unshakable, I know it's wrong I'm an iron mold, stoic mindset, and my veins is gold. I'll face the challenges, never lose sight. Stoic manhood, in a stoic fight. Head high, like a pillar of strength in a path of honor. I go to great lengths, pain and strife. I turn it to fuel in the stoic arena where virtues rule. Step up, step up, step up, step up, step up, and step up. In the whispers of the wind, stoic echoes ring I'm the architect of my fate, I build my own way I stand tall, unyielding like a stone Stoic principles in every verse I've known Holes in my focus in the grind, I'm aware In the face of challenge, I declare Through pain and strife, I navigate A stoic man in the world I cultivate I wear my scars like badges of pride Yeah, In the stoic rhythm, I let the beat guide Never showing despair, never taking a dive in the stoic anthem, I thrive. I'm unbreakable, unshakable. Yeah. Through the storms, I'm unbreakable, unshakable. I keep my mind steady, my heart cold as steel. I'm unbreakable, unshakable. Not to ever to use drugs or alcohol again. To decide to bet that you're going to begin to recreate yourself, that you're going to be reborn to a new state of consciousness. Whatever commitment that you make, keep your commitment to your commitment. No matter what, if it's hard, then do it hard. But keep your commitment to your commitment. And then it says, thy works. Most people look at activity that one engages in to achieve a predetermined objective. But works, commit thy works, it pluralizes. There's an S there. Learn this from Bishop. You got to watch these things in Scripture. Just can't go on the surface. There's an S. Then say, commit thy work. Whatever task, whatever talent, whatever skill, whatever knowledge you have and begin to make money doing that, making a difference, impacting people's lives, but commit thy work. So there's two kinds of work. There's external work, activity that you're engaged in, and there is internal work. Wealth, good relationship, peace of mind, good health, better community, whatever you want to desire. So the work is internal as well as external. So therefore, number one is First step is you got to live your calling. You got to decide what is it you love. Second thing is you've got to work on yourself. You don't get in life what you want. You get in life what you are. You have a job, you're generating $1,200 a year or $2,000 or $500,000. Whatever you earn, whatever you're producing in your life is a reflection of you. That's why it says judge a tree by the fruit it bears. I can look at what you are producing and I can tell you a lot about who you are. In order to do something you've never done, you've got to be someone you've never been. That's why scripture says you must be born again. You've got to die as you are now.
You've got to be willing to give up who you are now for what you can become. When you're working on a dream, at some point in... Work as if you were to live a thousand years. Play as if you were to die tomorrow. Prayers do not change the world, but prayers change people, and people change the world. Veni, vidi, vici, I came, I saw, I conquered Julius Caesar. You are controlled by the one who makes you angry. The heaviest burden we carry is the weight of our expectations. True happiness is not found in external things, but in the recognition of your true self. Muji How we should behave to tyrants. If a man possesses any superiority, or thinks that he does when he does not, such a man, if he is uninstructed, will of necessity be puffed up through it. For instance, the tyrant says, I am master of all. And what can you do for me? Can you give me desire which shall have no hindrance? How can you? Have you the infallible power of avoiding what you would avoid? Have you the power of moving toward an object without error? And how do you possess this power? Come when you are in a ship, do you trust to yourself or to the helmsman? And when you are in a chariot, to whom do you trust but to the driver? And how is it in all other arts? Just the same. In what then lies your power? All men pay respect to me. Well, I also pay respect to my platter, and I wash it and wipe it. And for the sake of my oil flask, I drive a peg into the wall. Well then, are these things superior to me? No, but they supply some of my wants, and for this reason I take care of them. Well, do I not attend to my ass? Do I not wash his feet? Do I not clean him? Do you not know that every man has regard to himself, and to you just the same as he has regard to his ass? For who has regard to you as a man? Show me, who wishes to become like you? Who imitates you as he imitates Socrates? But I can cut off your head. You say right. I had forgotten that I must have regard to you, as I would to a fever in the bile, and raise an altar to you, as there is at Rome an altar to fever. What is it then that disturbs and terrifies the multitude? Is it the tyrant and his guards? I hope that it is not so. It is not possible that what is by nature free can be disturbed by anything else, or hindered by any other thing than by itself. But it is a man's own opinions which disturb him. For when the tyrant says to a man, I will chain your leg, he who values his leg says, Do not, have pity. But he who values his own will says, If it appears more advantageous to you, chain it. Do you not care? I do not care. I will show you that I am master. You cannot do that. Zeus has set me free. Do you think that he intended to allow his own son to be enslaved? But you are master of my carcass. Take it. So when you approach me, you have no regard to me? No, but I have regard to myself. And if you wish me to say that I have regard to you also, I tell you that I have the same regard to you that I have to my pipkin. This is not a perverse self-regard, for the animal is constituted so as to do all things for itself. For even the sun does all things for itself, nay, even Zeus himself. But when he chooses to be the giver of rain and the giver of fruits and the father of gods and men, you see that he cannot obtain these functions and these names if he is not useful to man. And universally he has made the nature of the rational animal such that it cannot obtain any one of its own proper interests if it does not contribute something to the common interest. In this manner and sense it is not unsociable for a man to do everything for the sake of himself. For 
what do you expect? That a man should neglect himself and his own interest? And how in that case can there be one and the same principle in all animals, the principle of attachment to themselves? What then? When absurd notions about things independent of our will, as if they were good and bad, lie at the bottom of our opinions, we must of necessity pay regard to tyrants, for I wish that men would pay regard to tyrants only, and not also to the bedchamber men. How is it that the man becomes all at once wise when Caesar has made him superintendent of the close stool? How is it that we say immediately, Felicion spoke sensibly to me. I wish he were ejected from the bedchamber, that he might again appear to you to be a fool. Epaphroditus had a shoemaker whom he sold because he was good for nothing. This fellow by some good luck was bought by one of Caesar's men and became Caesar's shoemaker. You should have seen what respect Epaphroditus paid to him. How does the good Felician do, I pray? Then if any of us ask, what is Master doing? The answer, he is consulting about something with Felician. Had he not sold the man as good for nothing? who then made him wise all at once. This is an instance of valuing something else than the things which depend on the will. Has a man been exalted to the tribuneship? All who meet him offer their congratulations. One kisses his eyes, another the neck, and the slaves kiss his hands. He goes to his house, he finds torches lighted. He ascends the capital. He offers a sacrifice of the occasion. Now, whoever sacrificed for having had good desires, for having acted conformably to nature, for in fact we thank the gods for those things in which we place our good. A person was talking to me today about the priesthood of Augustus. I say to him, Man, let the thing alone. You will spend much for no purpose. But he replies, Those who draw up agreements will write any name. Do you then stand by those who read them and say to such persons, It is I whose name is written there. And if you can now be present on all such occasions, what will you do when you are dead? My name will remain. Write it on a stone and it will remain. But come, what remembrance of you will there be beyond Nicopolis? But I shall wear a crown of gold. If you desire a crown at all, take a crown of roses and put it on, for it will be more elegant in appearance. We face that endeavor. It's going to be the overriding 